see? Okay, that, that was good, but it's preview day. What's up, everybody? Come on. And uh, just such a such an amazing time of worship we just had. Caroline, I don't know where you went, but that was so so powerful. You ministered to my heart. I was over there weeping. I love your pastor too, and I love Jesus. And it was so so we're just so proud of you and how God is using you. And I just sense such a, an authority in your leadership today. It's because you love Jesus, and I think that's an amazing just testimony. Honestly, the perfect way for us to launch preview day is just highlighting what HC is all about. Luke 10, 2 is our key verse. It's all about um, Jesus' prayer that he he sees a harvest field in the world, and what he's looking for is exactly, Caroline, what you're doing. He's looking for laborers, for leaders to step into that harvest field who love him and love his world. And that's what HC is all about. So I know we've done it a couple times, but HC students, faculty, team, can you guys welcome our preview day guests? Tell them how much we love them. Thank y'all for doing that. I love, we love a culture of honor, and that's what that, that moment right there is all about. We do honor all of you guys, and it's a really really exciting. Hey, everybody, HC fam, we have 57 students who are visiting today. And so uh, Alabama, I think, was represented uh, strong. We had uh, Georgia represented really strong. Texas, Lone Star State. And I think there was Mississippi in there. Florida was in there. Ohio, come on, Ohio. And uh, even Pennsylvania was in the, in the mix today. So that's right. That's right. PA. That's right. And so, hey, welcome everybody. And parents, we also welcome you. And uh, here's our heart. I'm excited for us here in a moment to jump in God's word. One of my best friends here today is going to preach. Um, just want to take a couple minutes. You've heard this in different ways all day today. But our heart for you, parents, and those who are visiting with us today um, is just to experience HC. Of course, we know you have questions and we do our best to give you details. Uh, but this chapel moment is really all about experiencing God's presence. Because more than any of the details, what matters is you being where God wants you to be. And so our prayer is always, that especially in this moment, you guys would sense that and feel that, just as Caroline shared, that you would have your moment where you know you're exactly where God wants you to be. Because we know God has great plans for you, Colin HC, plans to prosper you, hope in a future you have a calling. It would be the honor of our life for that to, to, to be developed here. But if it's not here, we want you where God wants you to be. And so my prayer for all of you guys is that you would experience that moment today and believe it can even happen. Maybe it already has happened in this chapel experience um, today. I am excited today to, to have Pastor Brian Cromer uh, from Queen City Church come. And Brian and I uh, go way back now, I don't know, over a decade, youth ministry back in uh, the, the, I guess, 2009, 8, 9 time frame. We did, we did not meet in Alabama. We did not meet at a conference. We did not meet, you know, in, in Texas, which is where he was a youth pastor at the time. We met in China. <laughs> it's like the weirdest like friendship on the side of the road. We were both leading youth ministries that were doing mission trips. And I think we were both young in leadership, so we just needed like a hug because we didn't know what we were doing. Uh, but more than that, from the very first moment I met Brian and his wife, Heather, Jill and I just love them. Uh, they are the real deal. Love Jesus. Love Jesus. Uh, they lead an incredible church, but more than anything, their love for Jesus and, and his leadership and his family and the way that they are serving God together is just incredible. Uh, God is really using Queen City. He'll share more of that story in a moment. It's so powerful. Uh, Brian spent a little over a year here, right out of a year here at Highlands as he was getting ready to plant. So we really feel like as HC family, especially, we kind of adopted Queen City as part of our, it's just part of our family. And we're so excited for everything that happens there. We feel like, you know, it's just, it's just a testimony of God's faithfulness in their life. And we just are honored. That, that we get to be any part of it. And we have students there, and he'll share more of that uh, with you guys uh, here in a moment. Um, here's, here's the deal. He's got a, a great message for you. As I heard Pastor Brian share earlier about what he is going to teach today, it is directly from God for every person in this room for such a time as this. So open your heart up and stand to your feet and welcome Pastor Brian to the stage. What's up, HC? How we doing? We doing good? Hey, I do want to welcome all the parents and all the uh, people that are here for preview day. Let me just tell you, they did not pay me to say this, but I would go here. I would trust my boys to come here. I'm actually praying that you will let my boys come here and pay for it. Uh, that would be awesome. Um, but um, I, I love this place so much, and uh, I believe so much in what God is doing here. 
And um, if I haven't had a chance to meet you, hi, my name is Brian. And uh, let me just show you a little quick picture of my family. And uh, I think we have that. And so that's my family. We actually took that last week. We were in Disney. Uh, so God is good. Uh, so uh, the only other adult in the picture is my wife, Heather. And uh, we've been married 17 years. Um, I love her so much. And I call her my crown um, because Proverbs it says that a worthy wife is like a crown for her husband. And my girl is worthy. Okay. Um, and so uh, we have two little boys, as you can tell, two little consequences of passion. Um, and uh, some of you are getting there. Um, on the right, right there is Jordan. He's, he's 10. And then Caleb is seven. And uh, almost four years ago in January, 2018, we moved to Cincinnati, Ohio, knowing one family. That's it. We knew one family in that whole city with a dream in our heart to plant a life-giving church. And nine months later, on September 16th, 2018, we launched Queen City Church. I think we have a picture from Launch Sunday right there. That was Launch Sunday. I remember sitting on the front row and I had one of our, one of our best friends, Jason Laird, he, he told me, he said, don't turn around till like song two. Uh, just don't turn around. And I was so nervous to turn around. I didn't know if anybody was going to be there. And, uh, and man, 642 people showed up at launch Sunday. It was crazy. But if you like that and you clap for that, even better than that, 42 people gave their life to Jesus on that day. Yeah. It's an amazing day. Amazing day. And uh, last Sunday, literally Sunday, uh, we had Pastor Dino with us and Pastor Romeo was, was with us and we just celebrated three years as a church. We just had our three year anniversary as a church. We are officially 157 weeks in to this bad boy. I still count by weeks and because we are still undefeated, 157 and 0, I'm telling you. Um, really honestly, honestly, we, we feel, Caroline, I think you could attest to this, man, we, we feel like we are literally in the middle of a miracle. And I know that, that people that are a part of this house have experienced that. And uh, we are so honored for what God is doing inside of our church that we truly believe that we are living out Ephesians 3.20, where God can do immeasurably more than what we can ask or imagine. And let me just be honest, I have asked and imagined really big things. And to see God be so faithful and to be right in the middle of that verse, even through a pandemic, even through six months being completely online as a church, a year and a half in, even through everything that we've experienced. I mean, I'm telling you, it is miracle after miracle after miracle. And I would love to stand up here for two hours and share stories of what God has done. But there is nothing that I can brag about more than the fact that 867 people in the first three years of our church have made the decision to follow Jesus. Come on, we can give Jesus praise for that. Come on, that's 867 people that are going to be in heaven. Come on, that's 867 people that were lost and now they're found. They were blind, but now they see. They were dead, but now they are alive. Oh, yeah. God is good. Sit down again. And, um, but what often goes under the radar, what often a lot of times people don't know about our story, is people maybe know that. Well, what is often so far under the radar is the fact that we moved here. We spent a year of our life before moving there, here at this church, and around everybody that I see over here that is so much family to me who I love with all my heart, who I consider my brothers and my sisters, and there's spiritual fathers and mothers that are out of this house. And for a year, we decided to come here and serve this church any way that we could, but more importantly, to learn everything that we could, to just be a sponge and to soak up every single thing that we could in this whole thing. And, um, but what we didn't know is that in that time, God would do something miraculous. And the fact that we would have over 30 people in hand on a Bible. If you would have told me anybody 
would have moved with us to Cincinnati for just being here a short amount of time, I would have been like, you are crazy, Mark. But the fact that over 30 people have moved to Cincinnati, Ohio, from Highlands College, from Church of the Highlands, to help us not just launch, but be a part of our church, loving and serving and leading and all over the place. I mean, you cannot go anywhere in our church without somebody being connected to what God has done here. And here's the amazing thing, is that almost all of them are still there. Um, And if you've been around here enough, you know that is a miracle straight from Jesus. And, um, And there are people that I love with all my heart and their sons and their daughters. And that's a that's a part of our story that a lot of people don't know. And I want you to listen very closely. to this. Our church would not be our church without Church of the Highlands. Our church would not be our church without Highlands College. And I've uh, been there every single step of the way. And there are no words in the English language to fully articulate how much this church and the leadership of this church means to me. Um, to the entire team, to Pastor Chris, Pastor Mark, to Jill, to Jordan, to the KK, the whole team. JB, man, I love you guys so much. You are family in every sense of the word. And I am so grateful for how you have supported me and been there for me on hard days and had my back in ways that um, nobody on planet earth ever has and traveling with me to Cincinnati to scout out venues and let me use your expertise. And when I look around, man, I just see people that have our family in every way. And if I can just have one time in my whole life to stand in front of a group of people and honor you, I'm so thankful for our relationship, your investment, your leadership. I would not be where I am without you and what God has done in our relationship from a chicken stand in China. Come on, baby. And so, come on, AC, can you clap your hands and can you honor every single person on this team? Come on, to PC, to Pastor Mark, the entire team, yeah. Okay, let's jump into God's word today. Turn in your Bibles. If you have your Bibles, which I hope you do, because you are in Bible school, okay? Uh, So turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 22. And today we are continuing this series, Above All Else. And here's the theme verse in case you've been sleeping through chapel the last few weeks. Um, Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 15, this is what the Bible says, is that Christ, Jesus, is the invisible image, is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones and kingdoms, rulers and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. And these verses actually remind me of what Paul also said In Philippians chapter 2, some of my favorite verses in all the Bible, starting in verse 6, where he writes that though he, Jesus, was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges and he took the humble position, I love this, of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, He humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him, Jesus, the name above all other names that literally the name of Jesus is above all else. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, when I read these two verses, these two sections of scripture, I don't know about you, but I am so thankful for Jesus. And as I was preparing 
and thinking about our time today and thinking about this above all else theme, I was reminded of a conversation that Jesus had in Matthew chapter 22. And I think that we probably have read this before, we're familiar with this, but Matthew chapter 22 and verse 34, it says, but when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees with his reply, they met together to question him being Jesus again. And one of them, an expert in religious law, tried to trap him with this question. Teacher, what is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? See, here's what we have to understand. At this very moment, there were 613 documented commandments in the law of Moses. So when this man approached Jesus and said, what is the most important commandment? He's literally saying out of the 613 commandments, what is the most important one? If we only get one thing right, Jesus, what's the one thing that we need to get right? And Jesus answers so beautifully in verse 37 where he replies, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. So today on Preview Day Chapel, if you're taking notes, which I hope you are because I think there's a final at the end of this whole thing, I wanna talk to you for a few minutes about the most important thing. So what I wanna talk about over the next few minutes, the most important thing out of all the things, what's the most important thing? What is above all else? And just so you know, HC, this is hot bread. This is something that is brand new. I didn't reheat an old message and bring it to you. This is something that is some hot bread. Um, in fact, I believe that God spoke something to me. I was thinking back and preparing, and I, I, God brought me back to a moment in August 2018, a month before our church launched, and we had seven people do an official HC externship. And they came, and I met with them every month, and it was that month that I met with them. And I shared a version of what I'm going to share today, and I got done, and I felt like the Holy Spirit of God spoke to me. If you ever get invited to come back and do chapel, you got to share this message. And I didn't want to. Can I be honest? I didn't want to. I would much rather do something that may inspire, or may do this, but I, I, I do have a burden on my heart to help you. And, um, and by the way, let me just give you a little pro tip for anybody that wants to preach. Preaching, all it is, is saying in public what God told you in private. That's it. That's it. That's all it is. It's, it's as simple as that, and it's also hard. But that's what preaching is, and that's what I'm doing today. I'm telling you something in public, what he already told me in private. And we're gonna talk about the most important thing. Let's pray. God, we invite you over the next few minutes to speak to us. God, we don't wanna go through the motions. We don't wanna play church. We don't wanna play HC Chapel like we've been here a billion times. And, but God, we wanna hear from you. So we open up our entire lives to you. We give you permission to speak into any area of our life. We love you and we thank you for Jesus. My bold prayer is that every single one of us walk out of this place different than how we walked in. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody said a loud amen. amen. Okay. Well, the first time I ever preached, I was 16 years old, a junior in high school. First time I ever preached, it was Sunday night church. Come on, a lot of you don't even know about Sunday night church. That's where you go to Sunday school. It's old school. I mean, you go to Sunday school, which is the worst name ever, by the way. Um, and then second to vacation Bible school. That's the worst. Um, and, then, and then you go to church. Then you have like a 37-minute gap. Then you come back. And it's a brand new service. I mean, it's new music. It's a brand new message. I don't know how the pastor prepared that many times, but it was Sunday night church. And I said yes to this preaching opportunity at 16 years old, junior in high school, because my youth pastor asked me. And when I mean asked me, I mean he forced me to actually do this. And I have, I, you need to hear this, no exaggeration. 
This is not preacher story, no exaggeration. It was hands down the worst sermon of all time. The worst. Like if you look up worst sermon of all time, there is a there's a old tape of this. I mean, like it is hands down the worst. I preach, guys, on water baptism. Water, I have yet three years into being a lead pastor ever preached on water baptism. But my first time, 16 years old, in front of our church, you know what you guys need to hear? Water baptism. Let me just go ahead and just lay you on some theology at 16 years old and so I, I literally preach about water baptism, and uh, I had 30 minutes. I used seven. Um, true. I wrote out my sermon word for word, word for word, and literally read it. 11 pages of notes in seven minutes. Just, I... Just, just handwritten notes. I, I just had paper everywhere. Um, I never looked up. Not one time. I went up there. I never looked up. And I just sat there and I just read all my, my, my literally my encyclopedia of notes on water baptism. And I never looked up one. And guys, I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but my mouth got so dry. I had never experienced that before in my life until that moment. And it was like literally somebody took a vacuum cleaner, stuck it in my mouth and turned it on and sucked up everything. So imagine 16 year old me, papers everywhere, preaching about water baptism and just, I just like, I just like, I, I cannot, I cannot, I can't. And I'm like, what is happening to my body right now? Like I just, I had no clue what was happening and um, I never experienced that before. And, and so, and, and I didn't even end right. I just sat down. Like, I just, I didn't know, nobody told me what to do. Nobody told me at the end of this thing, like, like what, how do I wrap this up? And so I just read all my notes. And then I, again, never looked up, went and sat down front row and just sat down. It was so awkward. And my youth pastor just kind of patted me. He didn't say anything. He didn't say good job. He didn't say, you know, <laughs> we'll just keep working on this. He just, just patted me, just like, good job. And, um. So that was the first time, and if you would have told me that night, like if you go to my 16-year-old self and say, hey, guess what you're going to be doing the rest of your life? Say, so you're going to be doing this. I, I would be like, you are absolutely insane. Like there is no way on planet Earth that this is what I'm going to do. You are crazy. But that night, like something sparked on the inside of me as awkward and as bad as it was. It sparked something on the inside of me and I just kept saying yes to different opportunities. And over time, I knew, I knew that I knew that I knew. I didn't think, I didn't feel. I knew that God was calling me into full-time ministry. So I went to ministry school, I went to Bible college, I actually went to Lipscomb University, which is in Nashville, Tennessee, and I went to classes, and I took tests, and I read books, and I wrote the most papers, um, and I sat through chapels, they were boring chapels, they weren't like this, they were very boring chapels, but went to chapel, and I played intramurals, and I joined a social club which is like Christian school for fraternity. They just can't call it that. And, uh, and in the summer, I would do internships at, at churches. And so I got some ministry experience. And come on, I found my wife at college too. Come on, ring by spring, anybody? You know, like, <laughs> hey, four, four semesters, third semesters, get on it. You only got about a few more months, okay? Um, don't even act like that doesn't happen here. Y'all radars are on right now. I've been here. I know. I know. So, and after four years of school, I, I graduated with a Bible degree with some Latin words beside my name. And when I graduated, I knew what I wanted to do, but I had no clue where I was going to do it. And nobody would hire me. Nobody. And I looked everywhere. I mean, literally, my wife and I, we started looking everywhere. And finally, a church in Sulphur Springs, Texas. It's as big as it sounds, people. Uh, they gave me a shot. And they hired me to be their youth pastor. So my wife and, and I moved halfway across the country. Um, and that's where we cut our teeth in full-time ministry. And for the last 17 plus years, we've been serving in full-time ministry and building his church and in a few different roles. And if you were to ask me now, 
on the other side of 17 plus years of full-time ministry, like if you and I could just go to coffee and just sit across the table and just have a conversation and you would say, after 17 plus years of doing this whole thing, what's the most important thing? Now, my answer would be simple. The most important thing is to genuinely love God. It is. Um, above all else, to genuinely love God. I know that sounds so cliche. I know that that sounds like that's what you should hear when you come to something like this. Like the most important thing, yeah, 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 I love God. We hear about those things, and so it can bounce off our heart so easily. It can sound so cliche and overdone, but it's true. That the most important thing, HC, for you is to have a real, dynamic, growing, close, consistent relationship with God, to love God more than ministry, to love God more than your church. And by the way, that's the most important thing that you can do for every single area of your life. Regardless of where you go, regardless of what you do, the most important thing if you ever become a parent is to genuinely love God. You'll be a better parent. If it is, if you get married, come on, in Jesus' name one day, the best thing you can do for your marriage is to be close to God. If you're in the marketplace, the best thing you can do for your job and if you're an entrepreneur, the best thing that you can do is to be close to God. The most important thing is to genuinely love God. Just like Jesus says in Matthew 22, verse 37, when Jesus says, out of the most, like the most important thing is that you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. That's the first and it's the great, it's the most important thing above all else. You got to love God. And it turns out he knows exactly what he's talking about. But if I could be really honest, if I could be as vulnerable as maybe I've ever been in front of a group of people, when I was sitting in your seat as a college student in ministry school, pursuing full-time ministry, getting a Bible degree, in chapels, I would have amen that, but I wouldn't have known how to live that. And even more honest, when I was sitting in my office on the first day of full-time ministry as a youth pastor, took all my books that I got in Bible college and I put them on the shelves, I had a frame of my girl, had a like 1978 laptop, crank that bad boy open. When I sat there on my first day, I would have agreed with that. Yes, the most important thing is to genuinely love God, to have a relationship with him that's real and growing. But even on that day, I still wouldn't have known how to live that. Two years into full-time ministry, Two full calendar years goes by of leading, loving students, putting on services, doing all those things. After growing up in church, saved 10 plus years, Bible degree in my pocket, pastor at a church, doing ministry, preaching, leading mission trips, and I still didn't know how to live that. I wanted to have it. I knew I needed it. I just didn't know how. I was literally telling other people that they needed to have a relationship with God. And I myself didn't even know how to do it. And let me tell you, if you get to that point, let me tell you what it feels on the other side of it. You feel like a complete fraud. You feel extremely insecure and worst of all is I felt like I was already so far down the road that I couldn't even tell anybody. Because after all, I was the pastor. I was the one that people were coming to with questions like that. Like, how could I raise a hand and go to my pastor and say, hey, I don't know how to have a real relationship with God. Can you help me with that? And I remember in that moment feeling so insecure and feeling so much like a fraud. Like I wanted that so bad, I just didn't know how. 
Here's a good way for me to put it. It's like God was a celebrity. Maybe he was somebody that was famous, or maybe he was like an artist, or he was a professional athlete, like he was, or a celebrity, you know, that you follow. And it's like somebody that was so far off. It's like he was a celebrity that I admired, that I learned a lot about. Like I knew a lot of facts about this person. I even talked about them from afar, but I had no real relationship with them. And look me in the eyes, HC. I've come to tell you, I desperately don't want that for you. Desperately. I may never see you again in my life, but let me tell you, I believe God sent me here because I don't ever want you to experience what I experienced on that day, two years in. But what do you do when you finish this experience? When you finish Highlands College, when there's no more twice a week bomb chapel services? When there's no more motion nights and no more one services and no more Monday night small groups and no more five Highlands services per Sunday. When there's no more 21 days of prayer and there's no more Bible classes, when you're not surrounded by this amazing group of people that are all on mission and passionate about the same thing. And let's be honest, I think it's so easy to substitute intimacy with God with activity for God. That when we think like the busier that we are, the more that we can do, the more that we can serve, the more we can keep things on our schedule and calendar, that that's the same thing as being relationally close to God. But let me tell you, newsflash, it's not. It's not. And maybe that's where you are today right here, right now, or maybe you're in the same exact spot that I was. Like you want a relationship with God, but when all this goes away and you're not having my girl Caroline lead us in worship, when all that is gone and you get placed as Bobo Church in Anchorage, Alaska, and they're not a grow church and they don't do all these things, What do you do then? And deep down, maybe even right now, you feel like a fraud. You feel like I did, so insecure, and you feel like you're already so far down the road to raise a hand and ask somebody for help. Good news today, smile on my face. You don't have to stay in that place. You can have a, you can, you can have a real dynamic growing, close, consistent relationship with God that isn't dependent on ministry, that isn't dependent upon church services or Highlands College. And with the rest of my time, I want to practically show you how I spend time with God. And by the way, this is a way, not the way. So that's it. I just never had anybody do this, ever. I was like, people are like, hey, you know what you, you spend time with God. Okay, what do I do during that time? Come on, am I the only one that's ever felt that? Can I just fumble my way through? I'm like, what, like what, what does that look like? What do I do? Like, do I read something? Do I pray? Do I, you know, like, like, what do I do? Like, people tell me I have a relationship with God. I'm telling other people I have a relationship with God. But how in the world do I do that? So I'm going to show you what I do. After years of fumbling my way through it, when I didn't have to, when I could have just asked, hey, help me, help me. And so this is a way, not the way, but like Pastor Chris says, if it, my bullet fits your gun, shoot it, okay? See, everything changed when I started thinking about my relationship with God the same way as my other close relationships. So if you want a filter to think through, think through that. Everything changed when I started thinking about my relationship with God, just like, because I couldn't wrap my mind around a close relationship with God, but I could wrap my mind around a close relationship with my wife or a close relationship with, my, with one of my really good friends. And up until that point, everything about my relationship with God was about these two things, discipline and attendance. So everything was about like, I gotta do all the right things, and I gotta check off the boxes, and I gotta do it every day, and if I miss a day, I feel guilty, and I feel shame, and it's all about discipline and attendance. I just always gotta show up, and I've always gotta do these things that people tell me to do. 
It's about spiritual disciplines and it's about attendance and showing up. But that's not how I would ever describe like my relationship with my wife. Ever. Hey, you close with Heather? Yes. Why? Because I, I show up and I show up and I do this and I'm at the right place at the right time. And then I remember that conversation. I had that conversation and I did it that way. I never think of it that way. And so when it, when it got to that, like when you think about all your close relationships, they all have the same characteristics, all of them. Every close relationship that we have has three main characteristics. One is time. You spend quality time and quantity time. You spend time. Show me one person you're close with that you don't spend time with. It's impossible. So it's always time. Communication. Is that you, like, you consistently talk. And not only do you consistently talk, communication is both ways. It's never one way. Like every close relationship you have, it's you share and they share. You ever have somebody that just dumps on you all the time and you don't say anything to that? Is that person close to you? Absolutely not. So time, communication, the last is intimacy. Every close relationship, there's intimacy. That you talk about things that you don't talk about with anybody else. You do things with that person person that you don't do with anybody else. Time, communication, into me. And something clicked when I, that, that why can't my relationship with God be like that? And I've learned this, and you can write this down, it's kind of like the one thought that I have that I put on a screen, is that a relationship with God is not disciplines to check off, but a person to pursue. That is the biggest thing that I learned. And when I, that clicked, Everything changed for me. So here's how I spend time with God. After a ton of trial and error, this is how I spend time with God. First off, I schedule my time with God. You know why? Because tell me, like if you and I were to go hang out, guess what I would do? I'll get out my phone, I'll put it in my calendar. Hey, so next Thursday from four to five, we're hanging out, cool. Where are we gonna hang out? We're gonna hang out right here and there. So I put it in my phone and I would not miss it for the world. Why? Because I respect you and I would be there. I would honor you by showing up to that time. So if I would do that for you, why wouldn't I do that for God? So if you go to my calendar right now, you can see every time that I'm planning on spending with God this week. Why? Because if I do it for you, I'm gonna do it for him. And I guard it. And nobody else gets that time, just like nobody would get your time. And so I schedule my time with God. And here's all the things that I have with me. I brought it all so that you could see it. I love it. I get excited. I'm kind of a nerd with stuff like this. And I think it's because for so many years, I fumbled my way through this. And of course, I have my Bible. This is actually my, my QB2. This is my backup quarterback. So um, my QB1 just had to get rebound. And this year I'm, I'm going through this, this, this guy. This is the NIV. Um, I have the NLT, the Middle Tennessee version. Uh, that's where I grew up. And so um, I can say that. <laughs> um, so I have my Bible, of course. And then I have a journal. This is a journal that, um, that my friend Noah Nickel gave me. And so I, I have a journal. And by the way, before, I've never a big journal guy. Um, because I never knew what to write. I, I think guys maybe relate to this a little bit. It's like, what do I do? Do I just write my feelings? Is this a diary? Because if it is, there's not gonna be much in here. There's just not. I mean, I just, it's not there. It's not that I don't care. It's just write my feelings. I'm good. That's it. You know, like <laughs> journal for the day done. And so I, I, really, I really struggled with journaling, but I figured out what really worked for me. I, 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 in what I'm reading, I'll, I'll write verses, or I'll write part of verses, or I'll write like something that I feel like God is speaking to me from there, or that I'll process what I'm reading, or you know, if there's five rev, get some good rev in there, I'll write it down. If there's questions I have, I don't understand that. What does that mean? I'll write down questions. I'll write down thoughts that I have and, or I write down prayers 
that are triggered by what I'm reading and I kind of incorporate my prayer time with, with my time here. And, but I always limit it to one page. I don't ever feel pressured to like, oh, I've, I've got to do seven pages today. No, just one page and I'll wrap it up, put it on. It's one page. That's just for me. So I always have my Bible, my journal, some of my AirPods. And I always listen to instrumental music. Because if I listen to music with words in it, like that's all I think about. You like me? That's right. By the way, if you want to go listen to the playlist, I've been working at this for a while. I got a good playlist. If you go to queencitypeople.com slash Bible, you can see all types of resources. You can hear messages that we've, that we've talked about in our church, about the Bible. You can even find the playlist that I listen to. Spotify and Apple Music, we got you. And, but I got my man laying down the keys. So nice right now. So I don't, I don't have that right now. But I have my, my AirPods and I have my HC mug with coffee in it. <laughs> because how I many you know that you can't hear God without coffee? Come on, can I get a good amen? Come on, from Highlands College. <laughs> no, but here's the why. Here's the why. Mark, here's why. I always like to have coffee when I'm doing my devos. I had about 150 coffees leading up to our church starting. And almost every time, every meeting that I have, it's over a cup of coffee with another person. I've had cups of coffee with people over here. Starbucks, 280, let's go. And every time it's over that. So I do this to remind me, like I said, everything goes back through the filter of my relationship with other people. So if I would do that meeting with KK, I'm gonna have coffee because it's, because I'm sitting out with a person. I'm not checking off spiritual disciplines. I'm hanging out with a person. That's why I have coffee. So I have coffee, I have pens, I have a lot of pens. All the pens mean something different. Let me tell you what what my pens mean. So the black pen was the first time I went through this Bible, and now it's what I use for my journal. I'm telling you, I'm a nerd. Okay, blue, second time I went through it. Green's now, it's the third time. Red, I love red. Red's every time I see Jesus. Every time I see grace. Every time I see what God has done in my life, I underline it in red. So if you go through my Bible, you'll see red. You'll see grace. You'll see Jesus. And the whole Bible points to him. Tim Keller calls it the road to London. Is that there's, a, there's a, an idea that all the cities in England have a road that goes directly to London. Whether it's the main road or a very small road minuscule, don't even ever seen it, road. But there's always one road that goes directly to London. Just like Genesis to Revelation, there's always a road that leads directly to Jesus. So I look every day. It's like, Jesus, where are you at today? Come on, that'll change how you read the OT. I'm just telling you. Then the highlighters for those bomb verses. I don't want to, rem- I don't want to forget where that is. So we do that one. Then last, this is something that I have that is this little pocket commentary by, is a pastor, a theologian named Warren Wearsby. It's awkward shape, but it's amazing. And I call him Pastor Warren. And you can see a picture of it if you want to go find it. Super cheap. You can find it online. But this has been a game changer in my personal time with God. Because instead of like doing this massive, like, okay, I got to do this study and this commentary forever and just, I just don't got time for that. And so this has a few paragraphs over each chapter in the Bible that really helps me just understand. There's been times where I get nothing and I read Pastor Warren and I'm like, oh, that's so good. And it's just like light bulb. And so highly encourage this. And then I have one agenda the whole time. 
I have one agenda. Just spend time with God. That's it. It's not for revelation. It's not for messages. For sure, it's not for messages. It's not for ministry. This is just time for me to spend with God. And every time I start the same way, I take my Bible and I put my hand on this and I pray. And I pray something like, God, good morning. I'm so excited to spend time with you today. I give you permission to speak. You set the agenda. Whatever you want to talk about, speak to me. Whatever you want to talk about. And then when I get done, I'll go through what I wrote in my journal. And I always ask three questions. First is what's for me? What is like one thing that's just for me today? That's for me. And I'll kind of underline that, make sure that I, second is what's for an individual? And so Mark, if you've ever gotten a text from me that's encouraging something like that, hey, I read this today, I thought about you, it's that. Because I ask every time, is there something that I read that's for one person? Then third, it's what's for everybody. If you ever see me post a story on Instagram, that's what it is. Just for everybody. Let's chew on that a little bit today. And so a lot of times I get asked when I share some stuff like that, like, is there ever days where you get nothing? Like, what about those days? Of course I do. Like, nothing's wrong with you if that happens. And I had one of the... I, in fact, with the Bible reading plan that I do, I have it every single May 14th. I just know it's coming, May 14th. Like those days, here's what I wrote on that day. Can, do you have a picture of that journal? Yeah, that's May 14th, every year for me, nothing. That's what I read, that's what it is. It's a Bible reading plan. I can get any commentary. Pastor Warren don't got nothing, nothing. Blank page. But this is what I've written about that day. Have you ever had time with God like this, where you wake up, open your Bible reading plan, read it and get nothing? That was me this morning. I didn't underline anything. I didn't write anything in my journal. I didn't get any deep revelation, just a letter to a guy named Felix and a long genealogy that said Caleb, my youngest son, nine times. On days like this, I'm reminded of the importance and the necessity of having a real relationship with God, not having a legalistic checklist of spiritual disciplines. You and I both have had relationships so close where you can have the occasional day where you literally do nothing or say nothing while hanging out and still be close. Those relationships with no relational pressure to always be, quote, on. Those relationships where every conversation doesn't have to be deep. On days like this, I'm reminded that I can have that type of relationship with God. Where we are so close that we can have the occasional day where we do nothing and say nothing while hanging out and still be close. And if you, like me, ever have times with God like this, don't be discouraged. Don't give up and don't get frustrated. The goal is not to check off your Bible reading plan or fill your journal. The goal is to spend time with God. And the more you spend time with him, the closer you will get. And the closer you will get, you can have the occasional day where you do nothing and say nothing while hanging out and still be close. Listen, Highlands. God loves that you are pursuing ministry, but he loves you more. Hear that today from the words of the Father. He loves you more. He loves who you are more than what you do. And God wants you to make a difference. And he's called you to something big, to serve the church, to be in ministry. But he wants a relationship with you more. So if you want to make it, 
in ministry for the long haul, don't forget the most important thing is to genuinely love God above all else. I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. This is something that we do at our church a lot. And right now, before we do anything else, can you just, right where you're at, can you just pray this prayer to God? Can you just say, God, what are you speaking to me right now? Like just to me, what are you speaking to me today? Regardless of whether you're an HC student, what, whatever semester you are, if you're on staff, if you're a parent, if you're one of the students that are here, ask God, like, what are you speaking to me? What are you speaking to me? Maybe ask him this, what does my response need to be to what you're saying to me today? Ask him for a tangible step. Before I finish, I wanna pray for you. Because maybe God is speaking to you about your personal relationship with him. And I simply just wanna ask, regardless of where you are today in your relationship with God, do you want, do you desire a real, dynamic, growing, close, consistent relationship with God? If you're here and you know, I want that. I may not have that right now, or maybe I do have it right now, and I never wanna lose it. I never wanna lose it when I get into full-time ministry. I never wanna lose it when I leave HC. I never wanna lose it. I want to have a relationship with God that just keeps getting better and better. Or maybe you're here and deep down, you know you love ministry, but right now you don't feel close to God. And Maybe you're like me when I was sitting in your chair and I don't even know how, but you know that you want it today. If you're here and that's you, I want you to have the courage with nobody looking around just to slip your hand up in the air and say, that's me. I want a relationship with God more than anything. I want it more than ministry. I want it more than be placed at an awesome church. I want it more than a salary. I want it more than anything. I want a relationship with God. Come on, hands in the air. Say, that's me. That's me. That's me. That's me. I want that. Maybe even right there in your own words, just tell them that. Just say, I want a relationship with you just, God, we love you. We love you. We love you more than ministry. Ministry is awesome, but we love you. And we want to be close to you. Hear our heart today, God. We want to be close. We want to be close enough to hear your voice over all the distracting voices in this world. So God, would you tune our ears to hear you and tune our eyes to see you. We want to be close. We want a real, consistent, dynamic, close relationship with you. And God, right now, if we've put anything ahead of you, if there's been anything above you, we repent right now from that. And we just simply, we we change our mind. We change our direction. We say, God, you are first in our life. Say, God, we need you. We want you. We want you above anything else. And just, if you would, if you feel comfortable, just seated right there, will you just hold out your hands to receive this? I just wanna pray something I pray over my boys each and every day. Just let, let me let me be a pastor to you right now. Let me be a father to you. And God, I just pray blessings over all, every single person that's here today. God, I pray blessings over their relationship with you. God, I pray in Jesus' name that they'll be closer to you than ever before, that it'll be more real than ever before, that they'll love you more than anything else. And God, I pray in Jesus' name, will you give every single person a spiritual hunger and a spiritual thirst that is different than a physical hunger and a physical thirst. Because a physical hunger and a physical thirst, we eat, we drink, and we get satisfied and we get full. But God, I pray in Jesus' name that you will give every single person here, every single person watching later, every single person under the sound of my voice right now, a spiritual hunger and thirst that when they eat of things of you, God, when they drink of things of you, they just get more hungry and they get more thirsty. God, I pray blessings over every single individual times with God 
for each and every person that's here. God, I ask that words from your Bible will jump out. And God, I just pray that the rhythm of that would be you talk a little bit, they talk a little bit, that it'll be so conversational. It'll be so close, so real not manufactured, not fake, something that is when they get up to minister, it is an overflow of that time. And so God, I pray blessings over that area of their lives. And we are so thankful for Jesus. And because of Jesus, we get to have that type of relationship with you. Because of Jesus, we have that type of access to you. And so right now, as we go back into worship, we lift up the precious and the mighty and the amazing and the powerful name of Jesus. Because that name, that name is what allows us to have that type of relationship with you. We love you. And it's through Jesus we pray.